Good to have your company. I'm Dr Barry Harker and you are listening to Life Learnings, conversations with Christians about their lives and ministries and how faith has impacted their lives. My guest today is Justin Tarossian. Justin is a young man who has felt the call to ministry in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. His great-great-great-grandmother is Ellen G. White, whom Seventh-day Adventists consider to have had the prophetic gift. Justin is visiting Australia for speaking engagements. In the first half of the program, we'll be talking about his work in ministry. Welcome, Justin. Thank you, Dr. Barry. Good to have you here. Lovely, lovely to uh, be able to talk with you today. When did you first feel a call to ministry? It's a good question. It actually happened when I was 11 years old. And my best friend, Scotty, and I, we both felt the Lord calling us to ministry. And people would ask us, well, what do you want to be when you grow up, as adults often ask? And expecting a typical answer of an 11-year-old to be, oh, an astronaut or a fireman, we would answer, oh, we're going to be pastors. <laughs> and they would, they would be a little bit taken aback and say, really, pastors? But uh, we both clearly felt the Lord's call to ministry. We were both spiritually inclined. We loved the Bible and spiritual things. And uh, unfortunately, at the end of that year, uh, he moved away out of state, quite a distance away. And the friendships that I developed weren't as spiritually focused. And little by little, I started to lose my way until I was 17 years old, where the story picks up again when God got a hold of me. So how did you know that that's what, what, that's what God wanted you to do? Mm. Well, not only was it... Um, the, the feeling and the, the drawing that I personally had. Uh, I loved especially spiritual parallels like parables and things like that. And my mind gravitated toward things like that and spiritual things. But in addition to that, I believe that when it's God's will for something to happen, he does not just reveal it to the person, just to us, but he lays it upon the hearts of those around us as well. Mm -hmm. And that began happening. My fifth grade teacher, Dottie Ross, she actually mentioned to my parents once, you know, I just can't help but feel like Justin has been given gifts that God wants to use in full-time ministry. The next year, uh, my sixth grade teacher actually shared with my mother that she would go each day before class started and pray next to each desk as she would walk through the room. She would pray for the students. And she said that that morning, as she walked by my desk, she just felt impressed with the word pastor kept coming into her mind. So it wasn't only the inward uh, sense of calling that I, I felt from the Lord, but it was also laid upon the hearts of my mentors and teachers and family members. I guess when you've been called, you can't consider anything else. It's like mm. that's all you can focus on. That's all you want to focus on. Yes, absolutely. Did having a famous ancestor like Ellen G. White... Uh, influence you in any way? I think that everything influences us to a degree, but one of the, the blessings of being a part of the, the white descendants of the white family is that my grandparents, my parents, there was never any pressure. They didn't ever say, now you need to be very careful because you know who your ancestors are and you need to represent them well. It wasn't the, the burden and the concern of them. So I didn't feel any negative pressure, which I'm very grateful for. But I think in a sense, uh, as, I, as I started to grow older and as I started to read Ellen White's writings for myself for the first time, which actually unfortunately wasn't really until my teens when I started to like reading, uh, I really felt that it was a high privilege to be related to people, James and Ellen White, people who God used in such a powerful way, and especially Ellen White, who God gifted with uh, the gift of prophecy to direct people back to the principles of Scripture. So what were your favorite subjects at high school? Well, I would have to say geometry was one of them. I loved geometry and physics as well. I really enjoyed physics. It just it was very logical to me, practical, and I enjoyed that very much as well. Well, we'll come back to that probably in the second part of our interview today. Um, where did you study? I grew up in Angwin, which is a little town in Northern California. It's a college town. Pacific Union College, the Seventh-day Adventist University, is there. It's about 1,500 kids or so, students. And I went to the high school there. Actually, I went from preschool all the way through year 12 there. And I said, man, I'm going to go anywhere for college but PUC. I've been here long enough. But the, as the Lord worked it out, 
I ended up studying there for my, my bachelor's degree as well. And so you had four years there? I had four years there at Pacific Union College in the theology department. And what have you done since graduation? Well, in 2008, it was uh, the financial crash in the United States at the time. I don't know if you could say crash, but definitely a, a, a dip in the economy. So the Adventist conferences, our church is organized into conferences, and uh, the different conferences of the church were not able to hire new pastors. In fact, I think they might have been cutting back on a few positions. So in 2008, I had a friend who, with his wife, was leading a, a youth evangelism team. It was called the YET in Central California. And it was a traveling youth ministry team of five or six individuals that would do week of prayer programs, organize Christian outreach projects, and give Bible studies to the uh, young people of the conference. So the Lord worked it out in 2008, from the summer of 2008 to the end of the summer in 2009 that I got to work on that team. And then the Lord extended a call for me to work at the Fresno Central Seventh-day Adventist Church with Pastor Stephen Bohr and Gary Jensen. So I was grateful for that. In addition to that, during my four years there and even during college, God opened up many opportunities to travel and do ministry, which I was grateful for. The Philippines and Guam and Palau, Ukraine for three months in college and uh, various other places. So the Lord, ever since I gave my life to him, it's been a, one adventure after another. What are you doing at present? Well, here in Australia, I'm spending my summer. I'm actually taking the summer off from school. I'm at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan, and I'm in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary there. It's been an incredible blessing since I started in August. That's August of this past year. And I've taken the summer off to do ministry here in Australia, in Indonesia for a couple of weeks after this and um, returning to work on my master's degree for another year and a half or maybe two years before returning to Central California to pastor. So you're really on a summer break at the moment. That's right. What have you been doing on your trip to Australia? Oh, it's been a, an incredible trip thus far. Um, I've really loved getting to know the people. You know, it's something that I love about Australia is everyone seems to be laid back and most people have a good sense of humor, <laughs> which I appreciate. But for the first week and a half or so, I was in Queensland, and there was a youth conference, fantastic youth conference called Witness there. And um, I had the privilege of being one of the speakers and also doing a, a seminar there, a series of presentations. And it was just so exciting to see so many young people really on fire for the Lord and serious about their faith, wanting to discover uh, more deeply what the Bible says to us for today. So after that, we came back down, a couple friends of mine and myself, to the Sydney area. And since then, I have been here at the Waitara Seventh-day Adventist Church doing a series uh, of meetings. It was from this past Saturday, the 12th, to this coming Saturday, the 19th. So what uh, are the topics that you've been covering? Oh, the, um, the titles of some of the messages, if you'd like to know, Prophets Then and Now. Divine Disappointment, where we talked about the history of the Great Disappointment in 1844. On Sunday night, we covered Understanding Them for the First Time, Reading Ellen G. White in the 21st Century. Uh, last night, we covered an interesting uh, prophecy that is claimed by many to be valid called the 2520 Prophecy and discovered that it is not really rooted in Scripture. And then Friday night, we're continuing with Seldom Heard Stories of Grandma Ellen, where we're going to learn about what she was like as a person, a grandmother, her sense of humor, uh, her favorite color, her favorite dessert, and just to get a better picture of what she was like as a person before moving on to, to close out the series Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon with um, my personal testimony, which I'm glad to be sharing a little bit of here today. You visited Sunnyside in Kurumbong where your great-great-great-grandmother lived for several years in the 1890s. What were your impressions of the place? What did it evoke for you? Well, it really, it really meant a lot to me to be there. And I appreciated hearing the stories that uh, Marianne, the, the tour guide there, the, the lady who works there gave, uh, or explained the stories that she told. They were really 
helped to bring to life the the woman that Ellen White was and what her family was like. As she was telling the stories, I could just picture the the 10 people that she always seemed to have around her dinner table, around 10 people at each meal. And I imagine just the children that she often took into her home to help raise the orphans, just running through the corridor. And uh, But it was really very, I guess you could say, nostalgic almost. I really... Uh, enjoyed being there and look forward to actually going back sometime and hearing more stories. It, it's really a peaceful place, which I loved uh, about it. I really love the fact that it's so peaceful and that it reminds me of Elmshaven, her last home in California, where my grandparents gave tours while I was growing up, where I got to, you know, kind of run around the place and um, join people for tours when they were walking through. But uh, I loved that it really is a, a place filled with peace. I was blessed just to be there and realize that this was truly a place where angels walked and directed her as she wrote and as she uh, sent off letters and correspondence, as she wrote some powerful life-changing books like Steps to Christ, The Desire of Ages, Christ's Object Lessons. Well, I had the opportunity to visit Elmshaven when I was visiting California mm, some wow. years ago. And I noticed that on the wall of her bedroom, she had some Australian wildflowers mm, yes. that she had taken back with her, which I think was a gift to her as she returned to the States. Yeah, I know from her correspondence, she was a bit reticent to go back because mm. the responsibilities that she would have on her return would be massive. And so mm -hmm. I think in a way, she almost preferred the the sort of slight backwater yes. of Australia to <laughs> the, the, the bustling part of America at the time. Mm. My own grandfather um, came to Australia. He was an mm. Englishman, but uh, grew up in New Zealand mm. and became a Seventh-day Adventist in New Zealand in 1893. Wow. And then later came to Australia to study at Avondale College in 1899 and 1900. I understand that Ellen White went back to America about August 1900. Mm. He always held her in the very highest regard, mm. and he had lots of stories that have come down through my family mm. to me of his association with her. I know that he used to uh, accompany her on the outlying, on the visits to the outlying centres where she would be speaking and so forth. What are some of the stories that have come down the family to you about your great, great, great grandmother? Well, one story that I, I love and always smile when I think about is of Ellen when she was a young mother. This actually came down through my great-grandmother, Ella Robinson, who wrote it in a book, Stories of My Grandmother, as well as her telling it to my mother, my grandmother. She was a creative person, and she had a good sense of humor, Ellen White did. When Willie, her second surviving son, was just a baby, Ella's sister, Sarah, loved to hold him. But at this point in time, she actually had tuberculosis. So... Ellen thought, man, how do I get Willie out of her arms so that he doesn't get <laughs> tuberculosis and get sick without hurting Sarah's feelings? So she had an idea. She decided to cross her arms, and she just inched over to get a little bit closer, and she reached out just enough to give Willie a little pinch, just <laughs> enough to make him cry. And as soon as he started crying, she turned and said, oh, he must want his mommy. <laughs> and Sarah, oh, yeah, that's right. She would give Willie back to her. And um, she said that she repeated this many times, and her sister never found out. Her, her feelings were never hurt. <laughs> but until she was well from tuberculosis, she continued this. Do you have any other funny stories about your... <laughs> Yes, great, there was great, a time great, when great she was she was 87 years old when she passed away. So this was her last birthday. And her 87th birthday, there was a missionary family called the Divinis in Japan who decided to send her a birthday gift. So at that time, there was a, a type of vest that was popular called a hug me tight. And the hug me tight came in the mail and her secretary, Doris Robinson, who was my great grandfather, married Ella, her granddaughter. He brought it to her. She opened it up. Wow, how beautiful. So she went to put it on, and she started bringing it together in the front, and it just wouldn't close. <laughs> and she got a gleam in her eye, and she looked at Doris Robinson, and she said, you better write to them and 
let them know that there's a little more to Ellen White than most people think. <laughs> <laughs> she actually, uh, believe it or not, she, she struggled a little bit with keeping weight off in her later years because she had injured both her ankles. So walking long distances was a bit of a challenge. But she had a good sense of humor. She was a joy to be around. And she really loved people. And people could see that she loved Jesus, most important of all. Yeah, I guess that's the most important thing, isn't it? Mm. Well, what are your plans for the future? Oh, well, in Proverbs, the Lord says there are many plans in man's hearts, but the, Lord count, the Lord's counsel that will stand. So my desire is just to discover his plans for me. I have a passion for ministry. I love to teach. Um, evangelism is a, a passion of mine. I love mission work, foreign languages, music, working with young people. So I feel like I uh, could go many different directions, and I'm not quite sure which specific direction the Lord would have me focus on. But I do know that after my master's degree, I'm going to be working for at least three years in full-time pastoral ministry back in Central California, which is a blessing because it's a mix of all of those in one. So I'm looking forward to getting back out into the field and pastoring in just a couple of years. The topics that you've covered on your trip to Australia are quite, uh, quite varied. Mm. What's your favorite topic that you like to speak on? Oh, boy, good question. I would have to say one of my favorite is one of my favorite is the seldom heard stories of Grandma Ellen because I feel that oftentimes people in the Seventh-day Adventist church and even beyond the Seventh-day Adventist community hear about Ellen White or they hear things that she has said or supposedly said. Uh, sometimes there are sayings that are falsely attributed to her. But often people get a picture of a stern, kind of uh, grouchy, older lady. Yes. But that's not the case at all. And I love to share stories that give us insight into what she was like and to share with people that she actually was a mother that was acquainted with hardships. She lost two sons, one at three months and the other at 16 years old. And just sharing some of the experiences, her own conversion experience as a, as a girl even, really brings her to life and helps people to understand and appreciate her writings all the more and the messages that God has given us through her. What do you think the impact was of the loss of her two boys? Because she had four children, didn't she? Four boys. Yes. Yes. The oldest, Henry, passed away at 16. And then the youngest, Herbert, passed away just in infancy. You know, I think that for any parent, that's an incredibly, incredibly difficult uh, thing to, to work through. I know that it must have drawn her to her surviving sons all the more. And I know that uh, they needed to travel oftentimes when the boys were young and at times, they, they let them stay with family members while they would be gone for a couple of weeks. And I believe that after that, she, even more after the death of Henry, their oldest, she pressed together as a family to make sure they were as connected as possible. But I think it probably, I know that it led her to a deeper, deeper trust in the Lord and a deeper dependence upon Him. Because that's really the only way that any of us can make it through in difficult times like yes, that. Yes, yes. She seemed to um, have a tremendous amount of resilience, but as you read her writings, you also understand that she was very human in mm. terms of her reactions and so forth to things. I'd imagine it would be a pretty amazing thing if God gave you the prophetic gift and there, <laughs> yeah, would, be a, there would be a tendency to want to feel a bit puffed up and mm. important about those things. Mm. That was what, was, what was she like Oh, she around was a, those issues? Very good question. She was a very humble woman. You know, it never got to her head. That was actually one of her main concerns when the Lord bestowed the gift of prophecy upon her at the age of 17. She said, Lord, what if I become proud and, and lift it up in my heart and, and conceited? And the Lord sent an angel to instruct her and to tell her that just in case that were to happen, she would be allowed to suffer physical illness and that that would cause her to lean on the Lord all the more and recognize that she was nothing in and of herself. And so the more that uh, she came to know Jesus, the more that she realized, like all of us, that we really have nothing good to offer except what God is doing in us and through us. Jesus himself said, I can of mine own self do nothing. So how much more are we dependent upon him? 
She didn't have a great deal of formal education, but when I read her writings, I'm just amazed at her turn of phrase, her mm. expression, and her capacity to get to the essence of something mm. really, really well. And uh, I'd imagine that uh, that would have been a gift that God had given her. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it also came with study and with time. You can actually see a progression in the style of her writing as well as the, the depth to a degree uh, mostly the style and the, the language that she used, the verbs, the words, from when she started with the book's uh, Spiritual Gifts, that series, The Spirit of Prophecy, it started, uh, it was called The Spirit of Prophecy when it began. It was expanded into Spiritual Gifts and different volumes, and now it's the Conflict of the Ages series, which is Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, The Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, and then The Great Controversy. Probably, not probably, I believe the, the most powerful commentary on the Bible and Christian history. But you can see a growth and a change in her writings from the beginning until those finished products. And she also, although she was not, and although she was not formally educated beyond the third grade, she was very well read. She had a, an extensive library. And somebody actually estimated not too long ago what she would be given as honorary doctorates had her were her works to be all considered in all the different topics she wrote on. And someone determined that she would have about 31, if I'm not mistaken, honorary doctorates in different areas because of all of her works, if each was a dissertation on the different topics that she wrote on in Christian living. So really incredible that uh, it really is an evidence that God's strength is made perfect in weakness. She was not just uh, informal, or she was not only limited to an official third grade education, but her health as a young girl was very poor as well. So God really chooses the weakest of the weak through whom he decides and desires to bless the world and show his strength and his power. So in a way, all that struggle was a blessing to her as well. Absolutely. I know that every writer is really an amalgam of everything else they've ever mm you know, read in their lives, yes. um, we are influenced by the turn of phrase, by the way people express themselves. So I can see that she would develop over time as she as she started reading. I uh, I find her material to be quite um, quite incisive. My my own introduction to Ellen White was reading her on education. Hmm. I had been a teacher for maybe half a dozen years when I discovered. Uh, discovered her writings, Councils on Education and Fundamentals mm. of Christian Education. And I thought, how did this lady get these insights mm. about education when she's had no formal teacher training? Mm. And uh, and so that, to me, was my real introduction. So I thought if she's been able to write so successfully on these issues that she wasn't trained on, what else has she mm. written that we're able to, to able to trust? Absolutely. Well, I think what we might do now is just uh, go to a break briefly. And when we come back, I want to talk with you about your early life and experiences. Sounds good. If you have any questions or comments in relation to today's program, you can call 3ABN Australia Radio within Australia on 02 4973 3456 or from outside of Australia on country code 612-4973-3456. Our email address is radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au. That is radio at the number 3abn Australia, all one word, dot org dot au. Our postal address is 3abn Australia Inc., P.O. Box 752, Morissette, New South Wales, 2264 Australia. Thank you for your prayers and financial support. I'm Dr Barry Harker and you're listening to Life Learnings on 3ABN Radio Network. I'm talking with Justin Tarossian. If you've just joined us, I'm talking with Justin about his life and ministry. In the next half hour, I'll be talking with Justin about his early life and influences. Justin, tell me about your family. Well, I was born into a home in Northern California. 
My grandparents lived just down the street from us, about a five or seven minute drive. My mother and father had one child, just me, and I'm the oldest, the youngest, the middle all at once. But we had a very close knit home. My parents and I are very close. Uh, they are wonderful parents. I'm very blessed. And I had a wonderful home to grow up in, in a beautiful place that was without any stoplights even, any signal lights, just a few stop signs, and trees everywhere, and the woods, waterfalls, and it was really a beautiful place to grow up that I was very blessed with. Sounds quite idyllic. Mm. What's your dad like? My dad is a, a good man. He has a good sense of humor. He's um, a people person, he loves people. He has a little bit of a shy side sometimes in, in groups, but, um, He's a very hard worker, very dedicated man, very intelligent as well. I'll never forget when they were being introduced, my parents, uh, to a, a church family. And one of the professors at Pacific Union College, where he had gone to school in the early 80s when he uh, studied there, he stood up and he introduced my parents. And he said, and this professor had been there for over 35 years, he said, Hovik was my student in the early 80s. And... To this day, he's the best student that I have ever had. And after that, I thought to myself, wow, I've got to step it up a little bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't, so I don't exactly have a 4.0 straight A's. He's a good student, but uh, really uh, a very intelligent man, but kind and very soft-hearted as well. So what does he do, Justin? Well, he worked on his degree in biochemistry and desired to go on into medical school. But after he finished his bachelor's in biochemistry, some things in life happened. Uh, his father passed away and uh, various other things, and it did not work out for him to go on into medical school to be a brain surgeon as he aspired to be. And he had started working in an auto mechanic and auto body shop at a very young age, at eight years old in his home country. And he was doing that as he was studying full time as well. So he was doing that to support the family. I was not yet born. But my mother and my two uncles, who had just come to the United States, and as he finished his degree and medical school didn't work out, he continued on with the business that he had started and was sharing with my uncle, his younger brother. So, um, what is your mother like? Oh, my mother is amazing. She's the best cook in North America, probably the best in the world. But uh, she loves the Lord. She has just really a heart of gold. She's uh, very sensitive, also intelligent, very musical. She plays the piano beautifully. She sings very well. And she actually grew up with uh, a pastor as her dad. So she has, she has definite strong connections with Jesus because my grandparents uh, raised all of their children to love the Lord. So she also has a, a very uh, good sense of humor. She's fun to be around. People enjoy being around her. And she's also a watercolor artist. Sounds tremendous. Uh, how did your parents meet? Well, my grandparents were in northern Iran uh, in the early 1950s after they had studied to be able to minister to the Russian-speaking people. But they were unable to enter into the Soviet Union and the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church sent them to be missionaries to a Russian-speaking congregation in northern Iran. Well, years later, after they transitioned from there to Lebanon and where my mother was born, they had to return from Lebanon to the United States where my mom was raised in Pennsylvania. But when she was 18, my grandparents transitioned back to Iran. This was when the government was uh, still a secular government. They had the Shah and Christianity was thriving there. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was doing well. And uh, religion, freedom of religion was, was really much better than it is now there, unfortunately. My grandparents were invited to be the mission president. My grandfather was to be the mission president. And they went. And then when my mom was 19, she went over to be with them. And my father, who is Armenian from Iran, he actually was teaching at the Seventh-day Adventist Academy. And he knew my grandparents. And then when my mom came, they met. And a couple years later, they were married and moved to the U.S. in 1977. Your home, you said it was a very happy home. What part did religion play in your family? Mm. Well, every week we would get together 
gather in the car after uh, a Friday night together of opening the Sabbath generally and beginning the, the Lord's special day together. And we would hop in the car and drive to church where my parents were there with me during Sabbath school when I was young, younger. And um, beyond that, during the week, Pathfinders, which is somewhat something like the Boy Scouts, if you will, in the United States, but has boys and girls, where you learn camping skills and different uh, life skills, sewing and various honors that you can receive and uh, whatnot. The Pathfinders was a big part of my life, and that was a uh, part of my life that really was not just social but spiritual as well. We had over 90 kids in our Pathfinder Club. It was the largest in the state at the time. And we had a great time and especially loved it because Jesus was at the center of what we were doing. We would learn about what the Bible said on various topics and how it had relevance for our lives. And then we got to enjoy each other's company out in nature, observing God's character and his handiwork through creation. I understand that you really like the outdoors. What do you like about the outdoors? Oh, everything. <laughs> the mountains are my my favorite place to be. It's probably because Angwin, where I grew up, is on the top of a mountain. And I grew up mountain biking behind the college where there are many acres of beautiful mountain biking trails. Going up to Tahoe in Northern California and going snowboarding, skiing. That was my, my father and my pastime. We would go up some years eight or nine times in a year and spend the whole day Sunday skiing and then come back. So I think that because I was out in nature so much as a child, building forts in the woods and playing by waterfalls, that now it's one of my passions. So I love to hike and bushwalk with a backpack and sleep for a few nights out in the mountains. And so I also love the ocean and just about anywhere in the great outdoors. What did you like to do apart from being in the outdoors as a child? Well, honestly, I, I didn't, uh, I'm not proud to say this, but I played video games. <laughs> Glad that I don't anymore. They were time wasters and I look back and wonder how much more productive I could have been had I not. But uh, I also played the piano. I um, was taking piano lessons when I was a boy. Uh, I liked to draw when I was younger as well and uh, have my friends over and we would often play outside. I had a large trampoline and I used to do flips. I, I still do, <laughs> but don't have a trampoline where I live now, but I love jumping on my trampoline with friends and seeing what kinds of tricks and flips we could do. Skateboarded for a little bit and rollerbladed. So lots of different So it sounds things. like you're a pretty regular kid. When did, when did you pick up the guitar and the ukulele? Well, the guitar I actually picked up thanks to my good friend Miguel Serrano, who lived with my family for just a few months as he took a year deferred from medical school for a year in 2008. It was my final year of college. He'd finished the year before and was taking the year off before med school, where he is now in Loma Linda. And uh, he said, you know, you should learn to play the guitar. And he was with us and... He said, look, I found you one for, for just $100, and it was a decent guitar. So I ordered it and little by little started learning. So he inspired me and helped teach me guitar, as well as my good friend Mel Ueki, who also taught me the first songs that I ever learned, Deep Persuasion and uh, Are You Tired of Chasing Pretty Rainbows? Oh, it's called Give Them All, Give Them All to Jesus. So after that, it was, I think, in 2000. 11, when I was pastoring, or 2010, in Fresno, that I decided to purchase an ukulele because it's similar to the guitar. If you can play guitar, you can play the ukulele, and it's much more portable. We could take it on day hikes with the youth and the different outings that we had, and it was just a practical thing. In fact, I even brought it to Australia with me. I know you sing. Have you taken voice lessons? I have not taken voice lessons in any official capacity. But I have read upon the, the correct use of the voice. And more importantly, I was a part of a choir in college or university where we not only had a large choir, but also a specialized choir. And the way that our choir director, Bruce Rasmussen, excellent director, the way that he taught us to, to use our voices is something that I keep in mind when I speak and that I've integrated into my speaking when I speak 
speak and preach and do seminars places because it's easy if you speak wrong to lose your voice. So while I haven't had voice lessons in any co- official capacity, being in choir has helped tremendously with that. What's your most vivid memory of your childhood? Oh boy, so many. Probably, hmm, one of my most vivid memories of my childhood would have to be seeing my grandmother for the first time when we were at the airport. I was seven years old, seven and a half, and my father's mother was coming from Iran to visit for the first time and she was gonna come live with us. She stayed for a year, year and a half, and then went back and then came back for another year later. But I'll never forget being there with my parents, just waiting for her to come off of the plane and meeting my grandmother for the first time, which was so exciting. Tell me about your conversion. I know that um, children that grow up in Christian homes still have to make a decision Mm. to be a Christian. Tell me about your conversion. I know you you felt a call to minister at the age of 11 and Mm -hmm. finally picked that up again at 17. Was there a specific time that you could indicate that you knew that you wanted to be a Christian for the rest of your life? Mm. Yes. Unfortunately, that didn't come until I was 17. As mentioned, uh, little by little, I kind of departed, I guess you could say, from having the Lord as a part of my life. I left his side, so to speak, different uh, life habits and and, um, hobbies and whatnot that were not spiritually focused and not even even really acceptable for a Christian started little by little creeping into my life. It was interesting that I started listening to different bands like Jars of Clay and these Christian rock bands. Little by little, the music started getting a little heavier and heavier until I started listening to what they call Christian punk rock and Christian ska and such. And in eighth grade, an older brother of a friend of mine, while we were at his house, put a CD in the CD player, and it was a secular punk rock band, and I thought, well, that sounds the same as what I'm used to listening to. So it was actually a bridge for me to transition from Christian music into the worldly music scene. It was... It was an interesting experience. I can think back to a number of times, a couple times, where the Lord was really trying to wake me up about how far from Him I had drifted. And I struggled with depression in high school and because of a a combination of things that were going on in my life and ultimately because I was running from God's calling and what I really knew in the back of my mind He was calling me to, a life in His service, I just progressively, things became worse. I'll never forget that uh, I was working at a coffee shop when I was in high school. And I was working at this coffee shop and my manager asked me one day, Justin, so-and-so stopped or they are unable to work on Saturday. They had to cancel. Do you think you could cover their shift? And, you know, being a Seventh-day Adventist and believing that the the Bible teaches in the Fourth Commandment that the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week and it says there that we're not to work in Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11, I had wandered from the Lord and I actually told her, well, yeah, yeah, I I think I can work. I could do that. And I'll never forget. She looked at me and she said, I thought you were a Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, and I said to my, I said to her, well, no, not really. I I believe some of the same things that they do, but I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. And I'll never forget, it was as if a rooster had crowed, (laughs) you know, just like when Peter denied Jesus and I... I almost turned around to see if there was a rooster in the room because it was so loud in my mind. And at that point, I was one of the times I can look back to to see where God was really waking me up to how far from Him I had drifted and how far from His Word I had drifted in my life practices. Times like that, you can see what you're capable of. mm, This is true. It came to a point in my life when I was 17 that... um, I had been depressed before, but never like this. Just the guilt of things that uh, had been going on in my life and ultimately from running from God's call had piled up and I was bedridden depressed. I mean, I was stuck in bed for like three weeks. You know, it was basketball season and I was on the team and people were wondering what, you know, what's going on with Justin. I had a roommate at the time who was wondering, you know, what's going on. And 
it was really bad. And I finally had so much time to think that as my mind was going over the last six years, three, especially the last three years, I said, Lord, if I've just been running away from you all of this time, like Jonah, and you still have a work for me and you can still use me for you, then show me. And I prayed for a sign. We were waiting for a phone call with a specific yes or no answer. And I said, Lord, if they call and they say no, then I'll know that you can still use me for, for working for you. And within minutes, the phone rang. Hadn't rung all day. And it was that call. And the answer was no. <laughs> and I said, that's the Lord answering. And his answer is yes, I can still use you. And I desire to. So after that, it was a slowly but steadily and surely upward walk, and I praise him for it. Have you ever had any doubts about Christianity since that time? Never. Not a shred of doubt in my mind since then. Have you ever been influenced by um, people to um, maybe do things that you didn't want to do? Well, I think we're all influenced by people to an extent, but the decision boiled down to me ultimately. So while yes, I at times have been influenced by others to make poor decisions and I've made those decisions. I've also unfortunately in my BC days before Christ, I've also influenced people for for the worse as well and for poor decisions. What about the other way? Who are the people that have influenced you in a positive way? Mm. And what about people that you might have influenced in a positive way? Well, I think that some of the most influential people in my life, without a doubt, are my teachers. And I praise the Lord for great teachers growing up in elementary school, especially in high school as well. My grandparents, my parents, my teachers, and uh, they've really helped guide the direction of my life by mentoring and, and leading me in times when I especially needed direction. But I suppose that some of the people that uh, may say that I've influenced them the most in my, my life would be in my time of ministry as a pastor in Fresno, at Fresno Central Church. Some of the young people who I think of one who really wanted nothing to do with the Lord, dressed in virtually all black, was never smiled. And through not just myself, but other people who were working in ministry and praying for her and spending time sharing the promises of God's word, she decided in an answer to prayer to be baptized after an appeal one evening. And um, she came back just smiling. She told you, guys, I want to be baptized. And I'll never forget that uh, I had prayed the night before. I said, Lord, please reach this girl and bring her to yourself and help her to give her life to you and be baptized within one year of today. Well, not only the next night did she decide to be baptized, which was a total flip, but beyond that, literally one year to that day, she was not only baptized in February of that year, but it was October. And one year of that to that day, she was actually preaching in a youth-led evangelistic series, appealing to others for them to give their lives to Jesus. That must have been very satisfying for you. Oh, it was incredible. And is, is, that the, is that the area where you get the most satisfaction, seeing someone commit themselves to, to Christ? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's nothing sweeter than seeing someone go through the waters of baptism and saying, Lord, I want the old me to die and cleanse me from my sins and raise me to a new life in you. I guess I should correct that the only thing sweeter than that is then seeing that person grow and strengthen in their Christian walk to the point that they're leading others to the foot of the cross. So you've described some of the things that maybe went wrong in your life. Um, do you find now that that makes you a more compassionate person in dealing with other people to Absolutely. see the sorts of things that you've had to deal with? Absolutely, most definitely. Uh, I've also learned kind of unfortunately in the hard way that we are very naturally, as humans, we're very shallow. There was a time in my life where I uh, was, it was a sophomore in high school and I was taking a, a medication, a medicine for depression at the time that caused me to gain weight. And uh, man, I gained probably 20 kilos, I think mm. it would be, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it's interesting how people treat you differently based upon the way you look. Sometimes it's the way we're dressed or the way we look. And the Lord really taught me through that uh, you know, the next year I got on the basketball team and I 
changed some things in my diet, and the Lord helped me to to lose that weight that I had put on uh, in combination with um, no longer taking that medication, which helped. But that served to always remind me that we should never judge people based on looks or or appearance or the sound of their voice or, or anything, uh, but really give everyone a chance and get to know them because it's really the inside that counts. And we don't often see the struggles that people are having mm, that's right. uh, out of sight, do we? And uh, I Very think that's true. a really important point. Well, God hasn't been really getting a lot of good press lately. Mm. Uh, Christianity um, hasn't been getting good press in many ways. What do you think are the most powerful evidences for Christianity? Well, one of them, and probably one of the, or not probably, definitely one of the most powerful, is the evidence of a changed life. You know, if somebody, and my life is an example of that, I mean, the Lord brought me from the darkness of of sin and uh, depression to to the foot of the cross where the light of Christ shines, you know, and just since I've given my life to Jesus, everything has been an adventure and a joy. It says in Psalm that that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. And I love to travel. I love people. And the Lord has blessed me with so many opportunities to meet people, to do ministry and share Jesus with them, to travel. So the evidence of a changed life is definitely one of the very strongest evidences for the existence of God. But I believe that while that is essential, there's even a deeper and more intellectually concrete evidence than personal experience and the life change of those around us. Because people may have a change in life that's inspired by something other than Christianity. Mm -hmm. But what is completely uncontrovertible is what God has given us in his word that we call prophecy. The interesting thing about prophecy is that God says that an evidence of his existence and an evidence that he is God is found in, in something special, and that is predictive prophecy. In Isaiah 46, verse 10, starting in verse 9, actually, he says, Remember the former things of old. We call that history. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. So how do we know that he is God and that there is none like him? He tells us in verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So here God says, look, this is a way that you can know for a fact that I am God and that there is no one like me. He says, I'm going to tell you in advance specific things things and details of world history that are going to come to pass. And when they do, you can know when it was written, the prophecy. You can look back at history and side by side compare history with scripture and with those prophecies and see evidence that indeed I am God because only the Lord knows the future. You know, the devil doesn't actually know the future. Satan doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, But that's an amazing thing about the Bible. We find that there are over 120, some estimate over 300 prophecies specifically about the Messiah, giving us details of what would happen, that he would be sold for 35 pieces of silver, that he would, the price of a slave, that his garments would be gambled for when he was on the cross, that he would be die by crucifixion, um, that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be born of a virgin, Mary, miraculously. So all of these prophecies point us to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. And there are also other prophecies. The Bible is just so full of beautiful prophecies. Daniel chapter 2 that outlines the history of nations. Daniel 7, which is parallel to that. And also Isaiah 45, which I love, where God actually called Cyrus, King Cyrus from Persia, by name. 150 years before he was born. He actually says there in Isaiah 45 verse 1, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break the pieces of the gate of bronze and cut the bars of iron. 
And it continues on there. And this is actually a prophecy that was fulfilled when the kingdom of Medo-Persia, of whom Cyrus was the leader, led their army under the walls, the, through the gates of uh, Babylon, and conquered the kingdom of Babylon. So this is an incredible fulfillment of prophecy. Cyrus must have been brought by the Jews to, to read the scroll, and they must have read to him, you're Cyrus? And, you know, told him, look, listen to this, and read this prophecy to him. So it's amazing that uh, beyond the evidence of a changed life, we can see concrete evidence by comparing Scripture with prophecy. Wonderful. Now, your life is really a life in progress. Mm -hmm. You're not an old man. But is there something that you have learned that you would especially like to share with our listeners? Absolutely. Something that the Lord has been laying on my heart recently and something that he's not taught me just in the last 28 years, but more brought to minds of late is that there's something more that's needed than a knowledge of the truth. You know, sometimes as Christians, we pride ourselves in knowing the truth because Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth, praying to God the Father as he was. And he said, your word is truth. So having a knowledge of God's word, a knowledge of the truth, uh, the history of nations, we can allow it to stay in our heads. But I love the title of a sermon that Pastor Joe Cruz preached years ago. It was called Missing Heaven by 18 Inches. And sometimes we get the mental picture, you know, somebody just oh, reaching out and on their knees and having fallen, you know, just 18 inches short of the, the pearly gates. But really what he meant there was that's the average distance from the head to the heart. And a lot of times we can allow knowledge to go into our heads, but not enter our hearts, so to speak, or, or change the way we live and affect our lives. So we can have a head full of knowledge, but a heart void of the Spirit of God. I think that's pretty sound counsel, actually. Yeah, the Lord actually says that in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10, that it's not just the truth that we need, but a love of the truth. And I think that that's something we need to remember is that we need God to help us to love his truth and not just to know it in our minds. Do you have a favorite passage of Scripture that you would like to tell us about? Yes. And explain why it's your favorite? Absolutely, gladly. 2 Corinthians 5.17, which says, Therefore, if any man or any person be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Behold, all things have become new. So why is that your favorite? Because sometimes we wonder, can God really change me? When I give my life to the Lord, it doesn't feel sometimes like like things have changed, but the reality is that when we let Jesus into our hearts, that he changes our, our desires. In the same way that somebody's taste buds can actually change and they can develop a taste for something new, uh, whether that's good or bad, he can change our musical taste buds. He can, he can change our spiritual taste buds in our entertainment, the things that we desire to do in our free time. And it's just amazing that God says, even our natural tendencies that may draw us to sin and to the wrong thing, he can transform that. And that's why I love that passage because I've seen it in my life. And I know that when Christ enters into our lives, when we surrender ourselves to him, that we're like a new person. Justin, it's been great talking with you. My privilege. Thank I you wonder whether you'd like to just close our conversation with a prayer for our listeners. Absolutely. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much that you love us enough to meet us where we are, but you love us too much to leave us there. Thank you for being the God that can transform our lives, who can change our desires, our, our loves, our passions. And Lord, we, we thank you that you want to change us and you want to change our lives. Lord, thank you so much for the way that you've led in my life in the past. And it's just one of the millions, really billions of stories of people whose lives you have transformed for the better. And Lord, I ask that if there's anyone who has been listening today who desires that transformation and desires that change or is even curious about learning more, maybe about prophecy and comparing it with history, that your spirit would not 
leave them alone, that their minds would not stop thinking about it until they investigate for themselves. Lord, thank you that you promise that you'll not leave us here on this earth filled with sorrow and pain and death for much longer, but that soon you will come to take us home to heaven with you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, and we look forward to that day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's been great talking with you, Justin. Thank you for having me, Dr. Barry. It's my, my privilege. Next time you come to Australia, we'll have to do this again. <laughs> Sounds good. I have been talking with Justin Tarossian about his life and ministry. Remember to tune in again next time as I talk with another fascinating guest on Life Learnings. Bye for now, and God bless you and keep you. You've been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.